Today's scripture reading is God's Word, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 through 14. <coughs> Examine yourselves. See to see whether you are in in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you have failed the test. And I trust that you will discover that you have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. Not that people will see that we have stood the test, but that you will do what is right, even though we may see seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong, and our prayers is for your <clears throat> perfection. This is why I write these things when I am absent. At that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority. The authority the Lord gave me for <clears throat> building you up, not for tearing you down. Finally, brothers, goodbye. Aim for perfection. Listen to my appeal. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit be with you all. start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you that you would send your Son, the promised Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, to save us all and to empower us to live a life worthy of you, Lord. As we read your word today, may we realize just how important that that gift was, what it cost you, O oh Father, that you would give your child for us to redeem us back. May we not live a life that is wasted, but a life of worth, a life that we choose to to forgive one another, to give up our own, and to think of others more than ourselves, a life of love as Jesus commanded. We just thank you and praise you for the time that we can spend together. We thank you for this place that we can come and worship. And most of all, we thank you for this church, the body of believers that come together. And one uh, God, one Son, and one Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So did you hear my phone go off earlier when it tweet tweet? Somebody had to hear it. So I sent a text out that said, whatever the name of the book is, something missionary. What's it called, Evelyn? You got it? Okay, well, it's all right. So now the name of a book, put Evelyn by it. And I thought I was sending it to my wife. I sent it to Debbie. <laughs> so Debbie had this question mark, what? So I went and told her afterwards what it was so she'd understand. I said, just thank goodness I didn't say, I love you, honey. <laughs> So you've got to be real careful when you use those things because they can be smarter than you. <laughs> See? <laughs> See? <laughs> that it did remind me to turn my phone off, though. So. so if you don't know it, we're studying 1 Corinthians on Sunday nights. We are overflowing to Sunday morning because, see, we study, we read God's Word through the week, we study, we come together, and then Sunday morning some of that's going to be an overflow with a, with a message. But sometimes we have that backwards. See, we come to Sunday for one hour's worth of church and we don't spend the rest of our week focusing on God and trying to get His plans for our life. We're so busy with our own we get distracted and everything. We think that this life is our own when yet we were created for God's purpose and His will. We were redeemed back at the blood of Jesus to serve Him, to serve one another, to love one another. So if you can, I'm plugging again, come Sunday night. We start out with prayer and then we go into hymn singing and worship and then we start eating and devouring God's Word. We spend a lot of time in it. 
We do have a book. If you don't have one, I've got some up here. And I also brought some more CDs for those who want CDs. Just come up afterwards and we'll be glad to, to give you one. So last week I mentioned that Jesus only uses the word church two times in the New Testament. The first was in Matthew 16, verse 17 and 18. This was after Peter realized who Jesus Christ was. They had already been called to come after Christ. They left their, their, their family behind. They left their business behind. They forsook all and followed after Jesus because of the wonderful signs that He did and everything. John the Baptist proclaimed that He was the coming Messiah. They saw God in Jesus and they said, We will follow you. But they still didn't get it. And we still see a big difference when the Holy Spirit comes upon them at Pentecost. But in Matthew 16 here, Peter has realized, Jesus has asked him, he said, who do, who do you say that I am? And he says, the crowd says that some of you say that you're Elijah, some say you're just a great prophet of God. He said, but who do you individually say that I am? Who does Alan say that Jesus is? Is he the Christ? Is he the promised one of God? Is He the anointed one that will take away the sins of the world and restore everything and lead us into eternal glorification? Because if He is, that's what I choose to believe. And if I choose to believe that and put my total faith and trust in it, then I am born again, not by flesh and blood, but by the Spirit, the very Spirit of God. And that power resides in me every single day to do so many things that we don't rely on the power of the Spirit to do. To be people that we're not, to do things that we're not. To love one another. To even love our enemies. So Peter said, Jesus replied, Peter said, you are the Messiah. Jesus replied in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Why was Peter blessed? For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So you can't point fingers at the world or anything else because they don't even have any comprehension. Even though see, they see all of creation and everything else and refuse to recognize that there's a God, God still has to come to you. He comes to you, wooing you to come to Him. Not just to have a relationship with Him, but to be His own child. To be a brother or sister of Jesus. And then we forget so many times that, that not only did He come to us, not only did He provide the only way, the truth, and the life, which is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we might be saved. But He is also the one that gives us the power, the very power of God that performed the miracles in Jesus and that raised Him from the dead. He gives us to live inside of us so that we can take up our cross and follow after Jesus, so we can deny our life and live for others, so that we can even love our enemies. And then verse 18 says, And I tell you that you are Peter. On this rock, on this belief that came, this faith that you have that comes from God, and Jesus even says, All we need is a mustard seed of faith. And he'll grow it into something extravagant from this little bitty seed. Because the power of life is in that seed in the first place. The power of God lives inside of you to transform you to be more and more like Christ. He said, I will build my church. Don't forget that. And the gates of Hades will not overcome. And that's exactly what happened. And the church is still here 2,000 years later. But let's see what happened soon thereafter that. Luke records in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Not some of them, but each and every one of them. All, if you didn't catch it right there before, but all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. If you believe, put your trust in Jesus Christ. You are a child of God. Nothing can ever separate you from that. And you are empowered, filled, and sealed with the very Spirit of God. <clears throat> and they began to speak in other tongues 
as the Spirit enabled them. Now we're studying Corinthians and we're going to tie some of this together because one of the divisions in Corinthians was, I speak in tongues. There was, I follow Paul, I follow Cephas. There were immoral acts. But see, the problem wasn't what these sins were. The problem was that there was still not a right relationship with God. Even though they may have been children of God, they were acting like illegitimate children. And that's not why the Spirit was put into them to seal them and empower them. <clears throat> if you go on down to verse 14 in Acts chapter 2, it says, Then Peter, huh, imagine that, the one that Jesus is going to build this church on. <laughs> Literally, this is what happened, is happening. This faith that Peter had, this solid foundation in Jesus Christ that was firm because God revealed it to him. And all he had to have was a mustard seed faith because God would grow the rest. God would do it. He didn't have to do it. Now that does mean, as John the Baptist says, that I must become less so that he can become more. That does mean, as Jesus says, that I must deny myself, take up my cross, and follow after him. Peter stood up, not by his own power and his own might, but by the power of the Spirit. If you remember before at crucifixion, he denied Jesus three times. He said, I won't do that. But he did. He said, I don't even know that man. I'm not associated with him at all. You have me mistaken. And now this is the same person standing up with the eleven, with the other disciples that forsook all and followed after Jesus. Born again believers, empowered now by the Spirit of God, living totally different lives than they did before. Because Jesus said, Behold, come and follow after me, and I will make you fishers of men. They stood up together. Peter raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Now I'm going to drop down to verse 40. You can go home and read the rest and see. Peter basically spoke the gospel message just like Paul does. He spoke Jesus Christ in no other way. He didn't use eloquent terms or anything. He used scripture all Scripture is inspired and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Oh, Paul wrote that, right? But he was talking about the Old Testament. The New Testament wasn't here at that time. So Peter quotes Old Testament Scripture and everything. And then we get down to verse 40. It says, with many other words, not eloquent words or anything, but just with words, he warned them. And he pleaded with them. He begged them. He beseeched them by the mercies of God, just like Paul did, because he had a pastor's heart that only comes from the Spirit of God that is given to the man. And this man is Peter, the rock on which the church is going to be built. And he said this, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. You can't love the world and love God. You can't have two masters. You will love one or the other either God or money, the created things, the things that, that we want and desire, the things that we think will bring happiness and joy and peace, when only the Creator and the loving Father can do that. Verse 41, Those who accepted His message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted. That means constant, continual, dedicated, readiness, adherence, steadfast, unshakable, in complete faith and wanting nothing else, waiting eagerly for the return of their Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. They devoted themselves to what? The apostles' teachings, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone united together by the power of the Spirit not divided, but united. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Well, now I know what you're saying. Well, they did mighty, wonderful things. They cast out demons, even raised people from the dead. But I'm going to tell you, when you go to your neighbor that you've been angry at for years and years, and you come up to him and say, will you forgive me? And you bring them an apple pie you just made, or whatever it is. They see a miracle there, because they see a changed life that only God's power can give. So don't think that there's not mighty miracles here. There's miracles all the time that God is performing us. We just have to look and see. 
And so many times after you've walked through the valley of the shadow of death, you look back and say, Oh yeah, He was with me. I remember that psalm. And I see these miracles in my life. It's a miracle that my wife and I are still together. And that's not meant bad. It is because you don't know all of our past. It's a miracle. And guess what? We can use that to witness. And I did just this week to a young man who was suffering in his marriage. And he said, you went through this too? I said, you're singing to the choir. <laughs> yes, we all have troubles. We all have heartaches. But you've got a Father in heaven who not only is there all the time, but He'll carry you when you need it. But you've got to allow Him. <clears throat> Every day... Oh, I skipped some, sorry. Verse 45, 44, we'll go back there. All the believers were together and had everything in common. That's hard to fathom. But isn't that what heaven's going to be like? What that means is, I don't care if I worked to bring home the bacon that day to provide a meal for my family, and my brother needs food also. I don't even care if the reason he needs food is because he didn't work today because he was lazy. Because I have enough compassion and love for him that Jesus Christ, God's own Son, Jesus the Christ, came and died for me when I was His enemy. So I really don't care. Now, do I want to enable Him? You can look all through your Bible for verses on enabling. You don't want to enable Him to sin, but bringing a meal to Him when He's in need for whatever reason that He's in need, that's helping a brother out. That's feeding His sheep, spiritually and physically. <clears throat> Verse 45, they sold property even in possessions to give to some in need. No, anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And what did God do as a result? And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. People came to restoration with God Almighty and their sins were not counted against them. They would not spend eternity apart from God in hell, but would spend eternity with God as their Father because of the actions and obedience that we did through the power of the Spirit. You don't see mighty wonderful deeds that are done there? People are being brought to salvation because the church was behaving like a group of Christ-like Christian individuals who cared more for others than they did for themselves. They were following after Jesus' commandments. A new commandment I give you, and that is to love one another. Wait a minute, that's not new. Oh, yeah, it is, because I just set an example for you that's totally new. To give up heaven to come down to earth to live and testify to you, and then die for you, if that's what it takes. That's the church that we see. That's the church that Jesus said, I will build my church upon, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So, how do we need to worship? How are you worshiping? As I said, if you come to Sunday, and the average attendance for Sunday, now if you look at statistics and stuff, do you go to church? Do you, do you go to church used to meant how many times a week? <laughs> now it means I go. Wait, wait, let's qualify that. You mean once or twice a month, right? Yeah. Then you mark off the box, I go to church. I believe if we go back in this book again, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart. All your mind, all your soul. Oh yeah, and Jesus repeated that. That was the greatest commandment. Because we can't love our neighbor if we're not loving our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind. See, there's this thing that stands in the way. It's called pride. It's a PR with a DE. Let's see, you need to read this way. A PR with a DE with a big I standing in the middle, right? See, Jesus was the ultimate example of humility, the opposite of pride. He gave up heaven to be with the actual creation that He created, equal to them, and then less than them to be humiliated and to die for them. Solomon, that wisdom, that man of wisdom, said this in Proverbs 11 too, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes 
wisdom. Saul of Tarsus was a religious man, a very religious man, but he was far from God. He tried to stamp out the way, the truth, and the life. He persecuted Christians. Why in the world would God ever use this individual to spread the gospel message to the Roman Empire? Except God is a mighty God, a forgiving God, and a God that requires service. Well, I can't serve God because of all of my mistakes that I've made in the past and stuff. <laughs> Look at Paul again. I don't think your mistakes were that great. So that's not an excuse. Oh, God can't use me because I'm not enabled. Well, then you're just blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. You're saying that the power of God that lives inside of you is not enough. Oh, now let's get down to the real point, the I in the middle again. I just don't want to yet. Half-hearted disobedience is full disobedience. If you don't think so, look at the relationship with your younger, your small child, and they start rebelling. Ah, yeah, that's true. And, and, and I have to correct their behavior for their own safety and because I love them. I want the best for them. They don't realize that. We don't realize that. But that's the purpose. <clears throat> Paul, Saul, though, became Paul. He became born again. He became a new creation in Christ, which we read about over and over, that he died to his sins, that the only thing that he wanted to pursue was Christ crucified and spreading that gospel message to others because he loved them so much. He had the ultimate pastor's heart that was given to him by God and realized and empowered by the Spirit of God. So he wrote to another church, the church in Philippi. In Philippians 1, verse 27, we start reading, and if you have an NIV Bible, it has a header above it that says, Life worthy of the gospel. It's a pretty good header to put there. Verse 27, whatever happens, whatever happens, good, bad, indifferent, whatever includes everything. Trials, tribulations, joys, top of the mountain, deepest valley. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy. Worthy of what? The gospel of Christ. Jesus Christ crucified. That which was given to you. The most precious thing in all of the world. The thing that no money can buy, no power can ever do. No man can ever come to God if it wasn't for God's gift through Jesus Christ. The gospel message. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I know that you stand firm in the one Spirit, striving together, not separately, because God established our relationships with one another. He established the church to be His body, His physical body, while He was at home preparing our place for us. We get the glory, the honor, the privilege of being His hands and feet. But what good is it if I sever my hand and throw it over there? What good is it if my hand is arthritic and won't work? What good is it if my hand just has a mind of its own and does whatever it wants to do and annoys me? But it can, my mind controls it because it's obedient to the head and the church is the body of Christ and we're supposed to be obedient to Jesus Christ to carry out the will of God which is salvation for every man who will choose to believe. Striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. What I believe in this faith that Peter proclaimed and therefore Jesus is building His church upon that same faith. Whether it's this big, this big, whatever, all you've got to have is faith in God and He'll do the rest. Verse 28, Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is a sign to them that will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also suffer with Him. I don't like suffering. But Jesus Christ suffered and died for me. When he started his public ministry telling everyone he didn't have a place to lay his head. 
He had no money to provide for what meals would provide him that day or anything else. He walked in obedience and faith to his father. He knew it was going to be hard. He sweated teardrops of blood in the garden because he was so distressed. That comes from being so emotionally distraught of the terror and fear of some anxiety event that's coming place because he knew what laid before him. And he said, Father, if, if you will, pass this from me, but not my will, but thine which is exactly what He taught us to pray. Our Father who is art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, there's a cosmic thing going on here that we don't even have any comprehension of. And angels and other angelic beings are watching God work through us. They're not watching us. They're watching God work through us if we'll allow Him. <clears throat> Verse 30, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Now the NIV gives another header, imitating Christ's humility. Therefore, there's that word, we've got to tie that other together, that's why we did. Because of what God did, the gospel message, the faith that we have. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from His love, any common sharing in the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being what? Like-minded. I told you to memorize a verse. Do you remember it? It sounds kind of familiar, this one. 1 Corinthians 1.10, it says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree with one another that in what you say and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought, just like he just wrote here to the church at Philippi, being like-minded. Continue on in verse 2 of Philippians uh, chapter 2. Being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, one in mind, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather... In humility, the same characteristic of Jesus, the characteristic that brought Him literally from heaven to earth and died for us. In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. In all of your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Well, let's read on. <laughs> Who... Being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to His own advantage. He could have called down angel armies to take Him off the cross, but He didn't because of how much He loved you and I. Rather, verse 7, or instead, He made Himself nothing. That word means void, emptied, useless, and hollow. He gave up His deity. He felt no advantage of holding on to being God so that He could die to save you and I. And not just you and I, but everyone else because we were all enemies. <clears throat> <clears throat> By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. It's another memory verse I told you to remember. We've talked about it several times. It talks about the message of that cross, whether it's foolishness or not. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved. I hope that's each and every one of you. It is the power of God doing it. That's the message of the cross. Back to Philippians 2 verse 9. Therefore God exalted him. Therefore, see, because of what he did, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the sun, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> So what does it mean to bring glory to God in my life? 
My works of righteousness aren't going to save me, and it's not my works. It's the works of God through me if I allow it. But what an obligation I have. What a response to love I should have, realizing what God did for me through Jesus and what He's given me by giving him, me His Spirit. <clears throat> Verse 12, we've got a therefore again. My dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God who works in you. You don't have to do it. It doesn't matter how messed up you are, how weak you are, how strong you are, how intelligent you are. It's God that works through you. To will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. The restoration of men to Him. Verse 14, Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. So there's no excuse for where you live. Matter of fact, that's your witness field. That's your missionary ground. You don't have to go overseas. There's plenty right here that we need to be doing missionary work in. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Oh, wow. As you hold firmly to the word of life. Now Paul could have wrote whatever he wanted to in here, the word of truth, the word of faith, but he wrote the word of life because this again, reading this, studying this, and letting the Spirit change my mind so that it will change my heart leads to abundant life, that abundant life that Jesus said He came for and died for. Not just eternal glorification, but that God-filled life now. For it is God's will that you be sanctified that you continue in that process of making holy, which He did already and will continue to do. <clears throat> and then, Paul says, I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. I'll be able to boast because I'll see the fruits of my work, my obedience, not because of my works of righteousness again, but because I denied myself and followed after Jesus. I'll see the fruits, God's power. I can't change anyone's mind. I was struggling here this morning. If you seem to hold a two-year-old, my arms were tired afterwards. This is probably the only point in my life when I can actually control her, but I really can't control her still. She can still wiggle out of my arms. She could scream enough that I dropped her down. But God will never let go of you if you are His child. He will never forsake you. He will never leave you. So Paul goes on to say, Even if I am being poured out like a drink offering, a living sacrifice, whether it will continue to live or he'll die for it in ministry, he will proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even if I'm poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. That is why he did it. So that He could call you to salvation and then call you to a holy life. Not because He has any power again, but because He's an ambassador of Christ. Speaking on Christ's behalf. I am glad and rejoice with all of you. That's somebody who is empowered by the Spirit. Somebody who has a pastor's heart. That's why I put part two, if you wondered why I put part two. Because last week I talked to you about a pastor's heart. But God wasn't through with that message. So I simply entitled it part two when I had nothing written. Because I've been working at the shop this week too. And went to be alone at work, <laughs> believe it or not, yesterday. To spend time with God and, and write the sermon that He already gave me the title for. Could you imagine being born again? And then the doctor found a note that said, Hey, when this child is born... I want you to put his grandpa's, deceased grandpa's heart into him. He needs an old heart. Well, now that would be ludicrous, wouldn't it? So when we're born again, God gives us a new heart. But see, there's the thing. We're born again. Why would we want to hold on to our old heart? Our own way of thinking. The old things that we thought used to bring us joy. Why wouldn't we want to let go of all of them and become a new creation in Christ? I mean, that's complete absurdity. Maybe it sounds better this way, or you can relate better this way. I grew up with Bugs Bunny. He said, what a maroon. What an imbecile. What a nincompoop. Right? 
Well, that's exactly the word that we get from Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the message of the cross is foolishness. It's moronic to those who don't understand. But guess what? You're still called to be the light of the world, so hopefully they'll see the truth. You have that privilege. You have that honor to be that. And to those who believe, those who are being saved, it is the power of God. A changed life is so incredible. So, this baby that's born should grow to maturity, right? It's absurd if he would stay drinking milk all the time and just stay there. You know, if you drink milk, you can live and survive off milk alone. It gives you about 70% of the nutrients that you need. But, as an adolescent, your body can handle the milk better because <laughs> God designed it that way. As you grow older, you can't handle the milk quite as well, and you're not getting the, the vitamins and minerals that you need in some cases. And you'll probably live, but you won't live the way you intended because you stayed on milk. And you will probably die of some type of digestive disease. But you can live off milk, but that's not what you were designed to do. You were designed for that milk to nurture you so that you would grow so that then you could eat solid food and you could be the witness to this world that God has called you to be. But there's problems, there's division. It's in every church. It's not just in Corinth. It's not just in this church. It's everywhere because we don't all fully rely on that power like they did at Pentecost. Why not? Who says we can't? The power of God hasn't changed. We just need to die to ourselves more so that Jesus Christ can become more. I can't do that for you, no matter how much I pour out my heart. You can't do that for me. But I tell you, it is encouraging when we do talk with one another. When we do lift each other up and do the things that we're supposed to do and pray with each other. I told you I was counseling some this week. And he said, thank you for what you did. And I said, no, thank you. Because there was just as much blessing flowing the other way. And I don't know what outcome there'll be. I don't know what the outcome there'll be in my life. But I want to stand firm with each of you as mature believers, not as babies. There was division in the body of Christ at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 4 read, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still, excuse me, worldly. Mere infants in Christ. I guess you just got to do whatever your wife says. <laughs> Throw me down. <laughs> I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. Man, those words must have been tough for Paul to, to write. But he had to as a pastor's heart. Excuse me. <laughs> Verse 3 says, You are still worldly, and he gives them an example. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere human beings? Let me get that for you. Are you done? No. Oh, okay. <sighs> the message of the cross is foolishness to some, and they don't grow to maturity. <laughs> Who would want to stay living as an adult baby? We were born physically so we could live, grow, and mature. Physically. Isn't our spiritual life the same way? Jesus says, unless you are born again. And Nicodemus did not understand that. You will not see or enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. And this is a process. You start 
by drinking milk, you grow, you mature so you can eat solid foods. Are you done yet? You broke the clip? I broke, your, I broke your penis. Okay. What else you're doing? Do it quickly. <laughs> Go do what you must do and do it. <laughs> Wait till my mom does see this. <laughs> Why would anyone want to not grow up? So why were you born again by the Spirit of God? I hope that gives you something you won't ever get out of your mind, right, Polly? <laughs> Tonight we'll start in chapter 5 of our book. If you don't have one, get one. It's over 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 23, where I just left off at verse 4. It's called Applying the Principles. Applying the Principles about growth in Christ by God through His Spirit. See, there were divisions. It wasn't a point of what the divisions were. It was a point that there were still divisions because there was a lack of maturity. It happens. I know a church one time that kind of got into an argument about a baby gate. You ever seen a church that did that? Or a toddler gate. But you know what? And I heard some of this, well, he said, she said, and stuff. But you know what? I also saw some maturity because I saw some of the ones that maybe shouldn't have said something they did, maybe they didn't, go and apologize and stuff. Wow. See, we have divisions. And if you know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about this church with the baby gate at the board meeting last week. So you know. And I will bring up anything. But we have divisions, but we've got to get past them. If you fall down, get back up. If you can't get up, God will do it for you again. Amen. And it's especially nice if a brother or sister helps you up along the way rather than pointing fingers at you while you're down there in the mud. Paul poured out his heart for the church, but that outpouring would not save them. As I studied for this message, I was kind of grieving along, and I understand what Paul says, you know. I, I, what, what can I do? What can, how can I make a difference? Just be obedient. Preach my word. That's what he said to me. But, but I want to do so much more because I see the value of this message of the cross. That it is the power of God to those who are being saved from hell, from eternal damnation. A separation from God that nothing else can do. God has done it. He did it once and for all on the cross of Jesus. Whether you take it seriously or you don't. Whether it's foolishness or it's not. And Jesus said, if, if you're not with me, you're against me. There's no middle ground there. So then God spoke to me. He said, do you remember that, that verse that you always have so much trouble with? I said, yeah. And He didn't speak with an audible voice. He didn't speak with a whisper. He spoke through... Hey, I've read and studied this verse. I think I remember something here. And I turned to Romans 8. And you know that chapter. I've read it 50 times, 100 times. I don't know. Because it's a Spirit-filled life. And I can't seem to comprehend how to do that. But He tells me as I mature, you need to die more to yourself so that I can grow you. And I got down to verse 32, and it says, He, God who did not spare His own Son, what we're talking about, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also along with Him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, also interceding for us, because the Spirit is as well. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. Now that's written of the Old Testament prophets. That they faced whatever it was to give Israel the message. But they couldn't make Israel take the message to heart. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Because there was division. 
There was a lack of loving God with all of your heart. There were other idols and things that came in into their lives because they didn't get rid of those things. <clears throat> For your sakes we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered but not the one that was slaughtered for you. The only one that was slaughtered to save you was Jesus Christ. He's the one you have to answer to, not me, not Paul, not Peter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we stop reading there for the night because that's where the chapter breaks. But that's not where Paul was through writing that passage. If you go on to verse 9, it says, I speak the truth. There's no pause, no break in this. I always read it as that pause. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the power of God, His Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Because everything I've just talked about, the Lamb that was slain and everything for me, that I have this peace that surpasses all understanding, that I have the greatest thing in all of the world, I could wish that myself were cursed and cut off for Christ. For what reason could you ever do that? Say such a thing. You can't do it. Paul knew that he couldn't do it. That's why he said, I could wish. Because my passion is so strong for each and every one of you that if I could, but it won't help, I can't, give up my salvation, I would for the sake of my people. I never read it that way till this week. I had the title, like I said before, I had the sermon. God said, all you can do is be what I've called you to do. Use your gifts. And that's what I'm going to do. I hope and pray it's what you're going to do. I hope you see the importance, the value of what God did for you through sacrificing His Son on the cross. We didn't kill Jesus. God sent Him to die for our sins. He became the atoning sacrifice that nothing else could to save us from eternity apart from God and to give us abundant life now if you'll let the Spirit of God transform you. That's why we read in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, it says, Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. You can go on to read the rest. That's Paul's last written words to this church at Corinth. He has gone there for three visits. I don't remember. I think he's going on the third one after this. But he goes three visits. He writes probably four letters. We have two because of his heart that he has. I would do anything to save you. But I can't. All I can do is be faithful to God and proclaim the message of Jesus Christ no matter what the cost. And that's what God created me for and rebirthed me to do. And He does the process all the way through. Father in heaven, we thank You so much for Your faithfulness. We thank You for Your love. We thank You for Your Word. And most of all, we thank You for the cross of Jesus. The cross that makes everything possible to restore us back to a right relationship with You. And that relationship is now. We're still breathing. You still want us to grow to maturity. Lord, may this be, this be a people, individually and collectively, that worship You, that take seriously what You did for us so that we can be a light to the world, that we can make a difference with the breath of life that You have still given us in this body. For this body is simply a vessel of Yours that we can use for Your glory and honor or choose not to. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. And I pray that prayer for each and every one here because this is my household. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.